Hello, my name is Eric Johnston, and I'm the founder of the Veteran Tales Project. This interview is with Dick Peasley. This is part one of a three-part series of Mr. Peasley's entire interview. In this video, Mr. Peasley talks about how he entered the Marine Corps and his experiences during flight training leading up to his combat flight experiences as a pilot of a CH-46 helicopter in Vietnam. We hope that you enjoy part one. We're excited to share with you part two when he talks about his experiences flying as Ronald Reagan's presidential helicopter pilot on board Marine One. In part three, he talks about being one of the original five test pilots selected to be out on the V-22 Osprey Tilt Rotor Program. It was an honor to meet and interview Mr. Peasley. I hope you like his story. You know, I like the uh, Marine Corps motto that I'd, I'd heard about, you know, they always take care of their own. And that whole year, uh, up until January, we prepared, we were preparing ourselves to go to Vietnam. Well, you know, the first, uh, very first time I really remember getting shot at, I was uh, a co-pilot. Yeah, because yeah. there's, there's no leaving and coming back. I mean, you yeah. orchestrated the play. And then spent two years flying President Reagan when uh, I was the commanding officer. Great motivational speech. He was always good. Yeah. And then he, then he says, but I can't tell if you're hearing me. Can you hear me? And uh, every white hat that ship I'm flying it. <laughs> so we're uh, oh, wow. we're sitting up there and see all these white hats flying and he starts, at the same time. Yeah, he starts you know, continues his talk. Pretty neat. Yeah. I grew up in Pest Robles, California, a small town on the central coast. I had a couple incidents in the military relationship where uh, it got me interested in the military. Number one, my dad was in World War II. Even though he never talked about it that much, he was an army guy and he was assigned to the Marine Corps. And he always laughed at the Marines, uh, looked down on him because he was an army guy. And I always said, during invasions of Guam and places like that, they told him, go in this foxhole and don't come out until we come and get you. Oh, wow. And uh, he's, I said, that's pretty neat. Uh, they took care of their people. Well, then I uh, started working uh, on ranches and I would drive tractors. That part of California was wide open grain fields for miles and miles. And it was between the Pacific Coast and Lemoore Naval Air Station. And the uh, jets from Lemoore used to love to strafe the uh, lone tractor out in the field. <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while, you know, I'd be uh, daydreaming on my tractor, uh, pulling a plow or a harvester or something, and then this jet would come over from behind and just scare me into next week. <laughs> and I said, you know, there's got to be a better life than driving this tractor. And uh, so when I was in high school, I started looking around for officer candidate programs that I could do while I was in college. And uh, so that got me interested in uh, the Marine Corps program, and it had an aviation contract with it. So if I qualified for aviation, then I would be signed up to go to flight school and I graduated from college, which uh, all happened at the right time. I graduated from college and immediately went to uh, Pensacola. And uh, that was the start of a fun, exciting career. And so Pensacola was the uh, site of our flight school for the Marine Corps, along with the Navy and the Coast Guard. So it was. Uh, what made you decide that for the Marines? Well, primarily because of my uh, dad's experience and, uh, you know, I, I like the uh, Marine Corps uh, motto that I'd, I'd heard about, you know, they always take care of their own, uh, kind of an elite force. Um, little did I know that uh, it was the right decision for me because, you know, I really like small units, teamwork, 
really liked the camaraderie of uh, small groups and it was just a perfect match for my personality and uh, my interest in aviation. Of course I uh, was really recruited and mesmerized by uh, pictures at that time of the Marine F-4 and A-4 uh, attack fighter kind of airplanes that everybody thinks are the, just the neatest things going because they're going fast and you're flying by yourself and blah 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 and all Tender that good fighters. stuff. <laughs> yeah. But uh, in reality when you get to Pensacola <clears throat> and the needs of the Marine Corps are stacked up against you know your class standing when you finish certain phases of flight school, you know, even though I was in the top 10% uh, of my uh, flight school class, you know, I ended up uh, not high enough to get a jet seat. Really? Because that was during the Vietnam War, was ramping up, everybody was going helicopters, and I, I think uh, two guys in my class were excellent pilots and really smart guys that I would love to have been as capable as they were, but they got the jet seats and I went off to helicopters, which was turned out to be a wonderful uh, event. You know, God takes care of those who just plug on and do their thing. Exactly. And I was uh, lucky enough to uh, get into some very interesting uh, positions in the helicopter field. I started off uh, flying a troop transport, CH-46 helicopter, which uh, at that time was uh, a, uh, pretty new to the Marine Corps, had its problems, but it was a, uh, a super helicopter for a new guy to get involved in because there were, uh, there were quite a few of them coming out at that time and you had an opportunity to join in kind of on the ground floor of that uh, that program. One little story about flight school, I was, you know, very motivated at that time to go into the, the jet community and work really, really hard. Well, didn't work out and turned out fine for me, but then I went into helicopters and uh, first couple of helicopter rides I said, this is, this is not what I bargained for, this is not fun. I, <laughs> you know, I had a really, really hard time flying the helicopter. I, I didn't adjust well to the slow speed and the hovering. You know, I was just motivated toward airplanes, and that was not working well. So immediately got it down for uh, not being able to perform. Had to go back to remedial stupid study, uh, basic flight stuff, and start over again. And uh, finally, one experience. Marine captain took me aside and said, look buddy, flying helicopters is going to be a rewarding experience for you. You've got to forget what's happened to you and just go forward. This will be the most rewarding experience of your life. And get with it. So the guy intimidated me and obviously I, uh, I got with it and uh, went on through the flight school program. And uh, Even though helicopters were Unique. It was still a challenge, and uh, so I got my wings, and uh, we were assigned to Tustin, California, uh, Marine Corps uh, base. There it used to be at the Blimp facility in Tustin. Oh, okay. You know, they yeah. had the uh, Blimp hangers. Well, that uh, that day I checked in there. I was faced with uh, the question of which aircraft or helicopter I wanted to fly. A new pilot checking in fresh from Pensacola. Didn't know a thing about really being in the real Marine Corps. We were just out of Pensacola. And the colonel that we, we met was a group commander. And he says, well, boys, we're just delighted to have you here. And you're lucky you have multiple opportunities. And he said, uh, you can go to the CH-34 squadron. And the CH-34 was one of the same helicopters we flew in flight school. And I had nothing but bad memories of, of that, <laughs> that helicopter. <laughs> and it was a very, very old. It was a reciprocating engine. Oh, uh, you know, underpowered. It, underpowered. Uh, you know, some of the guys could fly it like 
there was no tomorrow, but it was, uh, you know, it, was, it just seemed very, very antiquated to me. And then they said the other opportunity was the CH-46 uh, tandem rotor, twin jet engines, uh, brand new technology. Gee whiz kind of helicopter, and I said, that's for me. That's what I want. Several other guys in the room had good experiences of flying the CH-46 and, uh, I mean, the H-34 in flight school, so they, they went off to the H-34. And that was one of the best decisions of my life was to go into the new technology. Right. Because I got uh, assigned to a squadron that turned out to be stabilized. We were uh, being built up and I was like the second lieutenant to join the squadron. There were two captains, a major and a lieutenant colonel as the commanding officer, and there were just five or six of us there to start. Uh -huh. And we had like 15 aircraft. And so I had plenty of flight time. I was uh, doing jobs in the squadron that were interesting, working with the troops. Uh, you know, I was happy as can be. And that was in the May time frame. And that whole year, uh, up until January, we prepared. We were preparing ourselves to go to Vietnam. In January of '69, uh, we shipped out to Vietnam, and of course, spent the entire year in Vietnam flying uh, the CH-46. Was assigned to a couple different squadrons while we were in Vietnam, and uh, had an exciting. Wonderful experience there. I was uh, very blessed to be uh, to arrive in Vietnam with a lot of experience because I stabilized in the United States uh, for like six, seven months before we went there. Had more flight time than most lieutenants did, and uh, quickly moved up to uh, the aircraft commander and then uh, division commander. So I was able to lead flights and, and do a lot, of, a lot of fun things. Vietnam was uh, an interesting experience. Eye-opening, uh, personally threatening at times. <laughs> like when? Can you, you, can you tell me any stories? Well, funny story, uh, first day uh, landed in Vietnam, landed at Da Nang uh, Airport, big airport in, in a large city for Vietnam, small city for the United States, but a pretty large city for uh, Vietnam. And they said, well, we're jumping the bus and uh, we're going to drive to the, uh, the base. And I'd, I'd read too many articles about this and that, and uh, got on the bus and then for some reason I ended up on a six by big uh, truck and I decided to sit on the floor so I was out of sight of everything. And I guess nervous, somewhat scared, but we were just driving through town and after a while you became accustomed to the environment and it was uh, no longer a threat that I was. You know, first time there. First time touchy. there. It was, was touchy and a little intimidating. I always looked up to the guys who had been there for a long period of time and they seemed to have the, the swagger and the know-it-all and uh, that's something that I was yeah. soon picked up, but uh, first day was, was scary. First night, uh, went to bed and uh, you know the, my hooch mates at that time I moved in with some guys that I had known and we were all lieutenants pilots and they uh, we were up drinking and telling me war stories and things to expect and blah 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 so they, but they didn't tell me about the uh, mortar attacks that we frequently got at night and they didn't tell me exactly uh, you know what to sleep in, how to be prepared, and uh, they did tell me where the uh, shelter was. Right outside our hooch was a sandbag shelter that we could get in and hopefully protect us from any shrapnel or mortar fire. Well, uh, as it would happen, I went to bed normal, uh, just had a t-shirt on, nothing else, and in the middle of the night the sirens go off and there were people flying out the door, so there, there I went flying out the door, and uh, we got into the shelter. And uh, most of these guys were sitting there. They had their helmets on. They had a, <laughs> some sort of weapon with them. 
and they had a, a flak jacket or two, and I, I'm sitting there in a skimpy white t-shirt, bare ass naked, <laughs> on the cold sand. Oh, jeez. <laughs> of course, they, they immediately uh, lit the candles and stuff like that because there's no electricity in those things. They lit the candles and uh, they got a hearty laugh out of the new guy sitting there bare ass naked in the sand. <laughs> Um, I, I really didn't impress anybody with the John Wayne swagger at that time, but uh, <laughs> so that that was uh, a laugh on me. But then getting in the squadron and starting to fly, oh, what a, what an experience! I mean, that was uh, really using helicopters for what they were intended for out there, working with the troops, uh, both the troops on our flight line who maintained the helicopters, but more importantly the the young Marines uh, in the field, you know, carrying supplies to them, bringing in uh, fresh troops, uh, taking out uh, casualties, moving troops around. Uh, all those things were, uh, I thought, really worthwhile projects because you're really working for the guys who were in the mud. Mm -hmm. The grunts. Yeah. yeah. And uh, looked at the way they lived and their personal condition uh, as they were coming on and off the helicopters just made me so thankful that I was I was sitting there in a uh, clean washed flight suit you know clean util clean uh, underwear and uh, you could tell those guys had been wearing the same underwear for weeks at a time you know and that became the real highlight and justification for me that I, I was really doing something worthwhile uh, I was helping people, and primarily the medical evacuation. Uh, that was uh, one of the most rewarding, but frequently one of the most challenging missions to fly. Uh, if there's medical evac need for medical evacuation, it meant that somebody just got got hurt, firefight, bomb. Uh, hostilities are hostilities high. are high. Yeah. Somebody's need, needs help right now. And in Vietnam, uh, the CH-46 helicopter that I was flying was really well suited for that because we could carry multiple people. We frequently carried a doctor with us, obviously always carried a corpsman, so we could get there quickly, uh, make the rescue, get the people out, and get them on the way to either a uh, Navy hospital that was uh, not really a hospital, but it was a Navy uh, mesh kind of shelter okay. for recovery, or we took them out to the hospital ships. And the hospital ship was a real savior because it was pretty close by. It was away from land, clean, away from infections. And that's where a lot of the burn patients or seriously wounded patients went. And so, going out to the hospital ship and knowing that if you got the guy there in time that he was probably going to make it. Did they have a helipad on the yes. ship? Yeah, okay. the, all the hospital ships had helipads. Okay, and, uh, makes sense, that's, but I wasn't yeah. Yeah. sure. Yeah, and uh, that, that was really uh, rewarding to, to get the guy on board. You know, of course, we never knew what happened to, to people after that. Once in a while you would maybe get get word back on somebody. Frequently you could go, or you could go to the Navy hospital, uh, the MASH unit, and ask about somebody, see somebody, or even volunteer if you, if you had time, but we never had time to do that. But frequently one of our pilots would get shot, wounded, or somebody get hurt in an accident, and uh, we would go over there, but it was, one of those things where, you know, you had to bite your tongue and just endure the sights. Uh, it was really, really difficult to see. Mm -hmm. But in the same frame of mind, looking at that, you had to push yourself in the frame of mind that you got those guys out of the field, got them to help. Whenever you were doing the medivax, medically vax, was there any situations that you were that you knew you knew you were going into a really hot spot and was it scary or was it yes uh, really uh, those, those kind of things were uh, they were all 
always a play that you had to make up. It was kind of like playing football. You go into a football game with a plan, but then when things aren't going right, you know, you got to redraw the plan, redo okay. something. And helicopter operations where you're resupplying troops or you're moving large troops, a large number of troops into an area during an assault or something like that are well planned. You know, you got days to think about how you're going to do it. You got air cover, you got this and that, you know the terrain, you know the landing spots. But in a recon extract or a medical evacuation, these are pop up emergencies. Mm -hmm. And immediately you have to get put together with uh, air cover, be it uh, uh, a Marine Cobra, or at that time we still had the Huey gunships, or sometimes even the OV 10 Bronco that could provide some limited uh, suppressive fire. And then if even if there was a opportunity where you really had to get in there, you could get fixed wing air support, uh, A4s, F4s from the... Uh, How about the Sandys or the Spads, or basically Sky Raiders? Well, they were, in the, they were there before I was. I never oh, okay. really flew with them. Uh, there were a couple around... Uh, in the central part of Vietnam, but nothing in the I Corps area, the northern Vietnam area. So we used pretty much our own Marine Corps assets that were available to us. But those situations, you knew that somebody just got wounded, uh, the unit was in trouble, they had to move, they couldn't move with several wounded people, they had to get them out so they could protect themselves. Uh, so that was very very timely thing that you had to do. Do you remember ever getting? Do you remember getting shot at? Oh yeah, I used to bring the helicopter. I, mean, I don't mean that to be a dumb question, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the first uh, very first time I really remember getting shot at, I was uh, a co-pilot, <clears throat> and we were on a uh, extract to go in and extract uh, some wounded Marines who had been caught in a firefight and. Uh, outnumbered so we had to get the wounded out of there so these guys could set up a perimeter and uh, and then get more help so pretty timely to, to get that done and uh, I was a co-pilot and I was sitting in the seat as we landed and I felt this uh, warm fluid running down my back and it turned out to be hydraulic fluid and then uh, you know part of the uh, uh, flight, one of the flight control systems got shot out, so this warm hydraulic fluid, warm is not the right word, it's hot. It was yeah, warm, right. Yeah. On my back. Uh, but we still had another operating system, and uh, we got the people on board. During that mission, um, the corpsman ran off, carried in several uh, wounded Marines, and uh, several of the uh, folks on the helicopter left the helicopter to run off and bring people in. It was a little concerning because we had 50 caliber machine guns and the guys left their machine guns, ran to save the Marines and, mm -hmm. and bring them on board. Of course, we were sitting there as a big green helicopter with no, not returning fire at that time. <laughs> but, you know, you know, uh, there's a lot of camaraderie. You see, a f you see another Marine laying there unable to move. You go help. You go help. And it's always concerning. You're sitting there and you, you hear the bullets whizzing through the helicopter and metal making uh, golf ball sounds and you say, man, hurry up, let's get out of here. But you know that uh, you got That's going to be a tough spot hang, you gotta sitting hang there just yeah. waiting for everything to come back together so you can actually take back off again. Yeah, because yeah. there's no leaving and coming back. I mean, you yeah. orchestrated the play to have everybody there at the right time do the extract and leave. So you're on the ground and you're just praying that those guys are pre delivering suppressive fire, uh, that the Marines on the ground are doing everything they can to keep suppressive fire out there long enough for you to make your extract and, and get out. And, and I just hope that the 
helicopter holds together during that, uh, that whole evolution. Because sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. And the most dangerous time was on the approach. Right. Because you're flying slow at, at the end of your land, at, just prior to landing, you, you've got to slow down uh, and, and make that landing. So you're, you're a little bit high maybe and a little bit slow and when you land and get on the ground, then, then hopefully you're maybe indefilated a little bit or hidden a little mm -hmm. bit. But then when you come out, you know, you're slow for a short period of time. And so you're poking can, your head back up saying, yeah, yeah, here I am again. Uh, yeah. I had a shot at me. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so those, those two times were, were, were really critical. When you got down on the ground, sometimes you hoped that you, know, you were hidden. Mm -hmm. But I remember sitting out in rice paddies yeah, where you were... Uh, Wide open. You, you know, you were a duck in a pond. Yeah. And wow. everybody had a shot at you, and it was really scary to see the tracers and the bullets landing in the water all around you, and the Marines running on and off the helicopter to uh, to get the wounded on and or take off uh, emergency uh, supplies that they needed for the troops on the ground. So, well, I have some funny stories. Uh, you know, I remember once uh, uh, we were sitting in this uh, landing zone and we were, we were taking fire and we were waiting to get two or three wounded Marines aboard and they were dragging them through the water. And that, that just dragging somebody through uh, rice paddies is, is, is tough. And we were taking fire and my co-pilot was sitting there and he was frustrated. So <laughs> in a bit of anger, you know, he pulls out his 38 and uh, sticks it out the window to uh, return fire with a 38, which is, uh, but he, uh, we used a snub nose 38 as all the pilots carried. That was an issue weapon. Some John Wayne types carried real pistols, big guns, yeah. 45s, or, but uh, he had a snub nose 38 and he started shooting Well, he, his finger got over the tip of the barrel. Oh, and, oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. <laughs> So uh, he had uh, a reputation of uh, you know, inflicting injury on himself, and people told him, "Now don't you, don't you dare go to the hospital and claim a Purple Heart." Right, <laughs> because you shot yourself. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's amazing uh, to look back, and, and when you bring these Marines on board the helicopter, uh, you know, you're looking back or watching in the mirror you can see what, what's happening in the back of the helicopter and a lot of them when they get on the helicopter you know we we had large windows on the side of the ch-46 for you can see out but there's in the combat environment there was no plexiglass or no no real window there it's just a hole from and you could just stick your arm right out into the oh, slipstream well but the Aluminum sides of the helicopter were just very, very thin. It wouldn't stop anything. You could, you could poke a nail through it pretty easily. Well, as soon as they got on the helicopter, they would hide behind the uh, thin aluminum foil, thinking <laughs> they were safe. False sense of protection. Yeah. And, uh, soon they saw the 50 cals uh, firing from the side, and they, they pretty rapidly got up and started returning fire with their own. Uh, cruiser or oh, okay. individual weapons uh, as, as we were sitting in the zone or getting ready to leave even when we were flying out a lot of times they would continue firing it it was uh, it was exciting I mean there was nothing more exciting than sitting there with uh, 250 calibers uh, shooting out of the side of the helicopter okay. and the noise and the vibrations and yes. all that action going on at the same moment yeah great fun yeah. great fun but you know, a year was a long time. You know, because you're flying repeatedly. I was lucky that I was always in the same area, Da Nang, Marble Mountain area, and flew in the same routes, same landing zones. And we we didn't see a lot of progress, which was, was frustrating for for a lot of us. You know, we we'd have a major operation. The Marines and uh, maybe the Koreans and some Australians or 
whatever would be involved in a large operation. And we would go take this ridge line or we would take this large mountainous area, always west of Da Nang, and set up fire bases, resupply the guys. After two months, we would evacuate all the people, bring them back. Everybody would be awarded for their heroism and stuff, and then six months we'd go back and do the same thing over wow. again. Yeah. And uh, lose helicopters, lose pilots, lose a lot of enlisted uh, infantry people taking the same piece of property that we had willfully given up. I mean, there was no continuation. You know, it was just go out a little ways and stop. Go a little ways and stop, and there was, there was never any. But Keep pressing forward. Let's, let's go forward. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Were there any times do, going into hot zones or just flying around, whatever, that you thought, hey, this might be my time? Um, or does it? Are you, are you just so focused on doing the mission? I just so focused on doing exactly what I needed to do to fly fly the helicopter, mm -hmm. do the mission, get my people out of there. I was very, very concerned about my crew because, you know, I lived with them, worked with them all the time. And then, of course, bringing in or bringing out the uh, wounded who I didn't personally know, but they were Marines. And I would do what I had to do to, to save them. Not, not during, but sometimes afterwards I said, you know, that was really close. Or looking at the helicopter when I got back and saying, if that bullet had gone here instead of there, it would have maybe brought us down. We would have been out there in the field or maybe crashed. And, you know, it happened to friends of mine, but, you know, while you're flying, you never think, I never thought of that. I always said, this is what I've got to do. I've got to be as fast as I can be, land as quickly as I can, you know. And, and the, probably the most important thing was to plan it out well enough so that you you had had the chance, had the opportunity to be successful. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, you know, you said, "Gosh, if I had, if I'd done this, maybe I wouldn't have been shot up. If I'd done this, maybe the guy in the back wouldn't have been shot." Okay. Which is really unfortunate, and a lot of kids get hurt. But yeah, you know, that was the people you were day. picking up, or the people uh, that were on board. Waste gunners? Crew or? chiefs. Gunners, oh, crew chiefs, okay. Or gunners who right. got hurt. And that, that was really sad. That was hard to, hard to live with. Mm. So it was, uh, it was a contrast. You know, we were in the area that was patrolled and uh, by the Royal, not the Royal Marines, the ROC Marines, Republic of Korea Marines. Oh, okay. And they controlled a very large area south of Da Nang down toward the Chulai area. And it was a river bottom area, very, very fertile farmland, uh, not much terrain change, no mountains. And it was an area that uh, was used quite frequently by the uh, Viet Cong because they depended upon stealing rice and food from the civilians in order to maintain their, uh, maintain their forces. Well, the Korean Marines were nobody to be messed with. And if we had a mission down into the Korean area, you know, it's always very interesting to see you know, just what we're getting into. Uh, their operations were very methodical. We'd go out and do a patrol and land their people in various locations and they would sweep an area. And then a couple days later, we'd go pick them up and bring them back. And it was like a, an exercise done in the States. Really? Very methodical, never get shot at. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> and everything went smooth. But if you got a uh, call for a medevac or an extract emergency in the Marine, in the Korean Marine area, you better be ready for a real firefight. Really? Because they had come on some hardcore Viet Cong, or they were in the middle of a, a 
some of their people getting hurt. Yeah. And if you hurt a Korean Marine, you're in for it. Really? They, uh, they were ferocious fighters, and they didn't fight by the same rules that the U.S. government fought by. Okay. And uh, it was uh, one of those things that, uh, you know, there, there'd be a lot of casualties, almost always on, on the other side, if there were casualties. BC? On, yes. Yeah, okay. Or uh, maybe indigenous people who, who lived mm -hmm. there. Okay. Who All were right. in that area. And, uh, you know, they, they didn't take prisoners. They didn't take names. If fire was coming from a village, and that village was supporting the Viet Cong, that village was going to be gone. Wow. And it was... Uh, from their actions or airstrikes? Or their, their own personal actions. Really? Yeah. They, wow. They were... Uh, they knew... It was a different mentality. Different mentality than the U.S. has. Yeah. So, it was... Yeah, Eye-opening experience to work with them. Sure. And they had a very, very small aviation detachment uh, that was located next to our squadron and they flew a couple 01 bird dogs and they provided observation support for the Marines that were on the ground down there. FAC, right? Yes. Forward air control? Yeah, yeah. but but they they had artillery that, oh. was, that was there. They were artillery spotters more than anything. Oh, okay. And uh, because of the language, they didn't control jets. That was not <laughs> a good idea because the, the jets were speaking English and the Koreans were speaking Korean and you know they, oh I got you okay I, I so, guess yeah. yeah but they were uh, they were good guys and if you were working late at night in the squadron area and you wanted to go have a beer or two you could go over to their uh, flight line bar and and have a beer and of course anytime an American walked in there you were a hero because oh, wow. they always idolized the uh, American Marines for what the American Marines did in Korea. And, oh, yeah, okay. And the fact that we provided them helicopter support there in Vietnam. So that was always a, a fun time. And uh, serious business, hardcore people. I really idolized their, uh, their work and, and what they did with a small number of of people that they had in Vietnam, mm -hmm. but uh, nobody to mess with. They were, they were the uh, they, they had a different mentality than, than we did. They operated by different rules, and I, could, I know that the uh, U.S. commanders tried to suppress some of their actions because of um, their retaliation against the locals supported the Viet Cong. Mm, okay. Where we, we couldn't do that, wouldn't do that. That was right. not our, our mentality. Ours was more pacification and trying to build up the infrastructure of Vietnam, which obviously failed. Thank you for watching part one of Dick Peasley's interview. Donations can be made to the Veteran Tales Project on our website at veterantalesproject.com. Thank you for watching.